scripts. Um, <laughs> as I know, you're looking forward to delivering them to us. We're looking in the neighborhood of 5,000 words, June 1st. Um, Paul and I will follow up with you. Which year? <laughs> 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 he, <laughs> I think he does. All right, we'll, we'll talk. I think the length should be proportional to the time we have to speak. So I'm going to give you about 25 words. <laughs> All right. So as advertised, three people. Um, I think the order was J Jim, Evans, Ruth Ottman, and then Millie Solomon. Each will get 10 minutes firm 10 minutes, not longer, and then um, we'll, we'll see how much um, in the way of final comments there are, the, the, there is from the audience. Um, we have up until four, we might take that much and we might not, we'll see. So, Jim. All right, thanks. Um, that's like the sixth time Eric's reminded me it's only 10 minutes. I know. So, <laughs> I know. A bad reputation or something. So, so I, you know, I've been taking notes furiously throughout this great conference. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Paul and Millie and everybody for organizing it and Rachel. Um, and, and this is obviously a non-systematic take, um, but these were the things that I you know, thought were important um, that, that came up, or just a few of the things that I thought were important. I, I think that, you know, there's, there's some degree of very understandable defensiveness in the LC community. I think we're oftentimes seen as naysayers. I know I'm accused of that a lot. Um, I actually, you know, really resent that. I'm not a naysayer, I don't think. Uh, but I do focus on the negative um, to some extent because somebody needs to. And there is no shortage of people out there um, who are going to only emphasize the positives when it comes to genomics. Um, and we are needed as a community to try to keep the levels of hubris down um, in the biological and medical communities. Um, the, the hubris in genomics, I would say, is breathtaking right now. Um, and I think there, there are huge pre-existing motives for not finding risks. Um, and, and those are, are both venal um, and, and sometimes just purely monetary, but they're also very understandable personal um, pushback against finding risks because people are excited about the field. That's still no excuse to not soberly look at the, uh, the, the damage we can do. And I would say that the damage is proportionate to the sheer number of people that are impacted by the field. And of course, there's a tremendous push now to impact every human imaginable, right? Between, D, you know, from DTC testing to, I'll get to in a minute, inane calls to do whole genome sequencing on everybody in some kind of, you know, clinical or public health context. Um, there are great pressures to expand the scope of genomics, and that can only amplify the inevitable harm that always comes with anything we inflict on, on people. Um, there's nothing genetically exceptional about that. Every single thing we've ever tried to do in public health or medicine has negatives. We have to measure those negatives, and we have to be aware of those negatives and decide whether the positives outweigh the negatives. Um, the, uh, I, I like Eric's note, uh, you know, original um, comments about shuttling between um, or among different communities. I think that that we have to engage in that kind of psychological and actual practical shuttling with the medical biological community. We need each other, right? Um, we need, we are needed to point out hubris. They are needed to, you know, make advances when, in technologically, medically, when when we can. Um, 
among the forces promoting the uptake of genomics are, you know, the sequencing industry, the, the, the medical industrial complex that I like to I call it, DTC providers, um, the NIH, right? The NIH is, is highly complicit in, in pushing things that I think sometimes shouldn't be pushed. Um, but they also are um, responsible for whatever reasons uh, um, lay at the root of it with enabling the LC community to, to really exist in many ways. Um, so, you know, we've got a, a message that isn't popular, but we need to keep, keep uh, um, seeking and to, to publicize it. We have to keep looking for harms and publicizing the, our concerns because it's our job. And I say publicizing our concerns. I think that sometimes we're a very insular community, um, and and I would say that we can't, we don't want to miss chances to to um, avoid being insular. Um, the I'm going to skip that part. Um, I will mention again that as context change, these these even small harms get magnified. Right when you seek to do you know, inflict your favorite medical um, or scientific in, uh, intervention on the general public, um, the stakes are much higher than, than when you do it in the clinic. I, I think there are some things we discussed that, that we can use, hopefully, to avoid our own marginalization. One is we need evidence, right? We must be really um, conscientious about striving to generate relevant evidence that's, that is rigorous and can't easily be ignored. And we need to be honest when the evidence is reassuring. You know, we, we should feel good when we come up with things that are positive, right? Even though our usual role <laughs> is, you know, to be Eeyores, I guess. Um, <laughs> So, and as a plea from a quasi-outsider, I consider myself, I hope, I'm part of the LC community. I, I, I feel that's a great privilege. Um, but I'm kind of an outsider, too. I'm trained as a medical geneticist and a molecular biologist. We need to not speak in jargon, right? And I hear a lot of jargon. That's fine in this room. I think, I mean, I didn't understand some of the jargon, but I think most people do. Uh, but it makes us easy to marginalize as pointy-headed, irrelevant academics. And I would, would strongly um, say we, we should avoid that. We need to work with other communities um, to, that, that aren't just in genetics. We need to tackle big, important, and practical problems. Um, Chris, Wade, and I were talking about the importance of practicality. We, we don't, we shouldn't tr get lost in really fascinating but ultimately academic questions. We need to investigate things that matter, actual outcomes that impact people's lives, including things like, we heard Scott talk about insurance issues and health. Um, and, and interventions, um, like we heard um, in, in the talk today about uh, um, some of the psychosocial research. Um, I would recommend generally avoiding hypothetical studies as an editor. I hate getting manuscripts about hypothetical studies because the fact is most of us really can't well predict what we're going to do, right? So I would uh, encourage avoiding those and look for real data. Um, the... Uh, you know, as far as advocacy goes, if there are things we can agree on as a community, I think we need to be vocal in advocating because a lot of times, you know, we're so fair and we try to be so, you know, considered to this hand. You know, if FDR said I want a three-handed economist because every time I ask an economist something, they say, no, a one-arm. He ought not a one-arm economist because every time somebody asked him, when he'd ask an economist about something, he, they'd give him an answer and then he'd say, but on the other hand, right? We're very a fair group, but if there are things that we can agree on, we need to publicly advocate for those. Um, we all know LC should be NIH-wide. It's not gonna be well-funded um, to be NIH-wide, but I think there is an onus on us to, to try to work with people from other institutes and use the, the training we've gotten and the methods we've developed and the, the questions we've raised in genetics to go beyond genetics. And it's, it's hard because the funding isn't as ready, but you know, we heard at the ELSI Congress the same message from somebody who's an outsider. It's like, why is ELSI always just about genetics? Almost all of the things we're talking about are relevant to almost every other field of, of medicine and biotechnology. Um, 
we need ways to, to broaden our reach, um, you know, so I would encourage us to, to reach out to, to other um, institutes, people working on non-genetic problems. And then finally, I, I think we need to aim bigger. I'm not sure our focus is sufficiently ambitious. When I saw Chris's, um, one of his first slides about the huge number of articles that have been published looking at, um, you know, various um, permutations of anxiety and, and distress, it's like, you know, maybe we need to broaden things. That's why I made that comment about psychosocial. We need to perhaps emphasize the social implications. I would maintain it's very LC relevant to examine adverse impacts of spewing poorly understood information on, a, on an unsuspected public that's been duped into it by a medical industrial complex, by DTC purveyors. Um, that's a very big social issue. Um, I recommended that article by, uh, I think it's Elizabeth Rockwell, about the social costs of, of um, direct-to-consumer testing. We need to take those into account. It's not all about whether somebody gets you know, worried or not. It's about costs to society. Um, I, and finally, I'll end with just a, uh, um, I've got 29 seconds left, one of my pet peeves. The, the notion of things like whole genome sequencing for all is not, I'm, I'm not talking in a research context, which makes sense. Um, it's just really, really bad medicine and really bad public health. And it violates every axiom of, of good practice. And we need to be vocal about those things and push back on it. Um, and I got done four seconds to spare. So, all right. <laughs> So, um, first of all, I want to thank Eric. You really did such a magnificent job of organizing this conference, and it's really been a pleasure to be here. And um, it's a rare opportunity to bring us all together uh, to talk about this topic. So I really appreciate that. Um, so I just have a, a few areas that I thought were, that came up repeatedly that I wanted to say again that I really took note of. Um, and, you know, first of all, when Eric uh, gave his opening talk, he emphasized that in genetics we're increasingly beginning to understand the complexity of genetic effects on disease. And, you know, this has been an evolution where uh, in the 70s, we began to discover more and more genes of major effect. And now, you know, we're pushing the envelope further and further to try to understand the genetic complexity. And uh, along with that, I think we are beginning to recognize the complexity of the psychosocial impacts. So it's kind of, these things are going in parallel. And uh, more and more I realize that in order to tackle that complexity of the psychosocial impacts, uh, if, if you'll excuse the expression, it takes a village. You know, and that's, I mean, if you look at the kinds of uh, expertise in this room, you really see the tremendous transdisciplinary force uh, that it takes. You know, we are bioethicists, clinicians, geneticists, psychologists, social works, genetic counseling, sociology, communication specialists, anthropologists, quantitative researchers, qualitative researchers, lawyers, and one epidemiologist, which is me. <laughs> or maybe there's more than one, I don't know. Um, but in any case, I really think that it's so important in our field to bring together all of this expertise. Um, and another level of complexity uh, is in the types of genetic effects that we're talking about. So we need to consider um, major gene effects, com genetic minor gene effects, or low penetrance alleles, uh, of course, Uncertainty, we talked a lot about variants of uncertain significance. Uh, the context varies, uh, prenatal diagnosis, uh, adult, uh, and population screening. So we've talked about all of these and how they need to be considered when we're talking about differences in the psychosocial impacts. 
Um, another variation that is really important to think about is the symptomatic versus pre-symptomatic testing. And so, you know, these really have tremendously different uh, implications. Um, and I think that one thing that really emerged for me here is the particular salience of issues related to reproduction. Um, th I think there's probably no place where the psychosocial impacts are clearer than in the reproductive context. And we've, you know, we talked about real evidence from qualitative and even quantitative studies of uh, the impact of parents learning about variants of uncertain significance. And I think, you know, one should ask how much evidence do we need before we start thinking about policy, about the return of those results. Um, so um, another thing that had big impact for me was uh, the meta-analysis that Chris presented. Um, and I think the issue came up repeatedly that if we're looking for average effects, uh, we may not find them, but that doesn't mean that there aren't individuals within those averages that are particularly vulnerable. And so it, it really makes sense for us to be finding ways of understanding the variability in response and looking to identify predictors of vulnerability to the receipt of uh, genetic and genomic information. Um, and some of this is really going to come from qualitative research. So, uh, you know, I'm a quantitative researcher, but I increasingly recognize and value the importance of qualitative research. I'm looking at Rachel right now. Um, and planning a study, in fact, that weighs equally the quantitative and qualitative approach. I am. Um, and then from a quantitative and a qualitative point of view, we need to think seriously about who's being included in our studies. So most of the studies that have been done are in highly selected populations. And so extending them to the general population is going to be really, really important, and particularly marginalized groups and how they respond uh, to this information. Uh, and so my last comment is simply that uh, we talked, and it repeatedly came up, about how to intervene in the effects that we're looking for, and many of which we haven't found yet, but uh, what should we do about interventions? Um, are we ready to plan interventions before we even know what the effects really are? Uh, I think this is going to be very challenging to think about how to intervene both in individual effects and societal effects. And uh, it's challenging, but it's really important to think about that. Okay. The virtue of being last. Um, <laughs> I want to start with the agreement in the room that I heard. I came into the meeting expecting lots of disagreement, and I was really taken by the fact that we have some strong agreement in at least two areas. One is that when there is great uncertainty of the meaning of results, when the stakes are very high to terminate a pregnancy, for example, and when there's cl a clear action, high actionability, to terminate or not, um, I think we all experienced a lot of evidence over these two days that the, the, this is the, it, a very stressful situation and that people need help, whether they measure on certain measures or not. I think that, we, and you mentioned that, Ruth, in, in um, talking about the pre reproductive context. So I think that there was a lot of agreement on that. There was also a lot of agreement that com commercial and financial interests are driving the integration of um, genetic technologies into healthcare um, before the science justifies it. And that's not news, um, but it's important that bioethicists and LC researchers have not really address that. We've taken on throughout these two days, you can see a great focus on the individual factors, 
but very little on really a bigger picture, as, as uh, Jim just advocated, for the commercial and financial interests that are driving this well ahead of the science. We heard Barbara Biesecker call it a renegade phenomenon. And we heard Alison Werner Lynn describe some of the very meaningful negative impacts of allowing that renegade um, a phenomenon to go forward. In a lot of our conversations about that renegade, we, our habit of mind is to turn to uh, informed choice as the solution. And even some of the slides acted and used the word paternalism. If we weren't returning all these results, that that would be seen as paternalistic. But I think of, as important as informed choice is, and it's very important, um, it's, it's not sufficient. It's too weak a remedy for us to solely embrace that as the remedy. And it's not paternalistic, in my view, to consider withholding some information because it just doesn't make any sense. Um, while I was sitting here um, listening to the reactions to confusion and uncertainty, I was, re I was reminded of this um, one of my favorite quotes from T.S. Eliot. I think he said something like, where is the uh, knowledge we have lost in information? Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? I used that in my dissertation, which was on a very different subject. <laughs> but as you've said, these issues occur and reoccur in every aspect of biomedical technologies and their integration into society. And um, my dissertation was on end-of-life care and how we think about that. And that quote was equally relevant um, to all the research we were doing on how, how physicians in particular and later pa um, patients think about the choices they face near the end of life. So anyway, I thought, um, I heard the big agreement on those two areas. My hope, and this is advocacy, would be that we could build an equal consensus around stopping or at least mitigating the renegade enterprise, to use Barbara's term. Um, agreeing that when there's great uncertainty and little or nothing that we can do, and the, that, first of all, agreeing that there are high stakes. I think there are high stakes for the sharing of, for example, adult onset information about uh, the risk to a newborn or to a child. I think that is high, high risk. Whether we have a lot of evidence base or not, that's a common sense approach. Um, we've also heard about potential harms of overprotection of children and changing the nature, nature of the child-parent child bond. So I would hope that we could start to build a case or and, cons and hold our feet to the fire to, to look at more evidence around um, the harms that are associated with um, providing great uncertain information that creates stress and confusion before the science has really given us anything we can do about it. Um, why is there uh, an apparent lack of findings for, for these effects? Well, I want to get a little wonky about this and use my um, research methodologist hat. Um, We've wholesale imported biomedical research methods and metrics for what is really a, so, a, so, a social phenomenon. And so right from the start, there's not a good alignment between the methods and metrics that we're using and the questions that we're asking and the nature of the experiences that we're trying to capture. Um, but that said, I think we could do, in a next generation, I think we could do a better job of marrying up the qualitative with the quantitative. So again, drawing from my end of life experience, I remember that for decades we said, we just have no good measure of, the, of, of prognostic certainty about death. We have no idea of who's, which patients are likely to die or not. And if only we knew that, we could shape our, our interventions to that. And then Joanne Lynn, came up with just a common sense question. <laughs> you know, she, she asked clinicians to basically use their judgment and their years of experience to say, for whom would you not be surprised if somebody died in the last 12 months? And that turned out to be the better predictor <laughs> than any, of, any other tool that had been developed and that many psychometricians had worked on for a long time. So I'm kind of making a call for us to ask some common sense questions and we can also put some of them into Likert scales by looking at the factors that emerged in the qualitative research. If, you know, I bet the qualitative researchers in the room could say these, these three or four factors people arrayed themselves on and to turn those into questions with Likert scales. And we could start to do really much more sophisticated mixed methods 
research. In terms of uh, Joanne Lynn type questions, I would ask something like, how did it go for you? <laughs> and use the qualitative factors analysis to come up with answers we could quantify. Um, do you have any regret? Um, do you wish et except, you know, for etc.? Um, what would your advice be to others contemplating this, these tests? Those can all be quantified and they can be informed by the existing qualitative research. So I would make a pitch for that. The other thing is should we start to be thinking about this less as academic research and more as quality improvement research? If it is a renegade enterprise and it is getting integrated into clinical practice, can we start to do some of the interventional research that you mentioned um, and study the impact on people's understanding of their situation and also some of the perverse uh, things that we saw happen that people either blamed themselves more or saw less agency? We now have enough to go on that we could evaluate interventions that we put in place along some of these things that we're concerned about. So that's the second idea. The third is, maybe this is crazy, but I'm in inclined to think about disease or condition specific ways to track this. I think that Scott's um, description of the Alzheimer's work is really fascinating. And I think it's able to be good because it is specific. And so if we could think about maybe centers of excellence that are collecting research specific to a condition and maybe even real-time data collection through the establishment of some sort of registry of information and uh, of how we collect data as we do in quality improvement research and when systems are trying to become learning health systems collecting data as, as we are integrating this renegade enterprise. The last thing I want to say, and I have one minute and 30 seconds, is probably the most important. We spent a lot of time on the first day about isms about genetic determinism and essentialism. And a lot of worry in this room and a lot of history of trying to see whether that plays out in the general populace. And a, a, you know, a positive message from Celeste on the fact that the populace holds many, many values at, at once. Um, my urging is that we look at the genetic essentialism and determinism of our elites, that we look at scientists, science policy makers, health care policy makers, and funders. And bioethicists turn their gaze and put their writing on where we see our, I'm not going to say all, okay, our genetic determinism and, and essentialism. We fund NIH, but we don't fund CDC. We fund health, but we don't set fund education when education is a bigger predictor of health. So somebody's pretty big genetic determinist. <laughs> if that is where the priority for our funding goes, that is demonstrating the genetic determinism of our leadership. And while researchers are often reluctant to get into that fray, bioethicists shouldn't be. We should be influencing policy. That's it. <laughs> That's I didn't know good. it came with a sound effect, too. That was good. <laughs> good. I've done enough. I'm, yeah. I mean, I, I got caught off in the middle of the sentence, but it's fine. Thank you for letting me. No, I mean, basically, that, that it's, it's your point, too, about we need a bigger, bigger, bigger lens. Celeste asked us to look at a political, social, and psychological framework. I'm more interested in us standing back and looking at the integrity of our institutions and how they are being corrupted. And I don't just mean in this political moment, as I, I do mean this moment, but not only this moment. We, I could have said this eight years ago as well. And can I follow up on that and just say that, you know, it, it, it will never cease to amaze me that we live in a society that is dominated at every turn by science and technology, and yet our decision makers, our leaders, pretty much know nothing about science and technology. We need to be engaged in, in teaching them. And, you know, there are opportunities to do that, um, whether it's the judiciary, whether it's the, the legislative branch, whether it's the executive branch. We need to do that. And, you know, the Hastings Center has, has done a good job of trying to do that. We, we all need to work on that. It's, you know, if, if all we do is stay in our insular world and, and you know, publish our academic papers, we're not going to have any impact. Right? We need to write op-eds. We need to communicate with, with leaders. We need to teach mm -hmm. 
leaders. Yes. We need to teach scientists too. And that's true yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and healthcare providers mm -hmm. as well. I know it's been a long couple of days. Bob? Just your last point, Millie. Uh, I would argue the reason that, quote, we or our government or our leaders fund NIH but not education or CDC again comes down to money. So somewhere in the past few days I heard someone say that, you know, uh, there's a statistic that for every dollar spent in, spent in NIH that it yields, you know, eight dollars for the U.S. economy in terms of industry, in terms of patents that come out of the research and things like that. And I think that's why I would argue a lot of, excuse me, Republican funding support for NIH is not because of concern for the health of people out there who need the help, but it's going to help industry. And I think that may be part of the equation we need to think about and think about the larger surround. Well, it's the biomedical industrial complex, which yes, is driven exactly. by, yes, which is driven by our commercial and financial interests. And it's but who is going to speak to that? In, no, no, I, sorry. Who's going to speak to that if we don't speak to that? And we've just got to get out of our individualism box. I, I was just going to say it's increasingly entangled with a genetic frame, you know, this in complex that you're talking about. It's the geneticization is, you know, overwhelming right now. Introduce yourself, Joel, please. Joel Reynolds uh, with the Hastings Center. I'm hesitant to uh, talk after that wonderful wrap up. Um, I just want to add in the spirit of, of uh, thinking further about where to go from here that uh, one concept I kind of expected to hear more about uh, that didn't come up a lot was normalization. And so many of the arguments that were, or, or um, uh, congenial discussions that were going on about what kinds of evidence uh, are marginalized or not and how we are getting our evidence um, what didn't quite come up was the way in which if something has been fully normalized in the broader society, that's not necessarily going to be easily uh, researched. Um, people are going to say, yeah, I was actually fine. People are very resilient. They can become resilient to things that are on the whole bad or that ethicists might want to say are bad even if they say they're fine. Um, and the other component I would add is uh, questions of disability. Right, so much of the conversation in the last two days has been quite specifically about anxieties, worries, and fears of oneself becoming disabled in a particular way, or one of one's loved ones. And even though ableism was mentioned uh, by Maya uh, at the, during the very, very first talk, excuse me, um, I wonder about the extent to which we are or are not uh, sufficiently interrogating ableism as a uh, primary motivating factor for all of the both psychosocial and social psycho effects that we are presumably quite worried about. Hi, I'm, I'm Stacy Springs from Brown University. Um, I'm a meta-analyst by um, trade at the moment, so it's been really awesome to hear of the ongoing work that's um, emerged in the setting. Um, one piece of where to go from here is there was a really great um, set of papers published in Implementation Science like not two weeks ago, um, looking at um, how we can grade um, qualitative papers and integrate them into evidence synthesis products like systematic reviews and meta-analysis if necessary. I would encourage all of you to look at it, critique it, break it up, you know, and, and really make commentary so that people in our community can actually integrate the qualitative um, work that that is so robust and so important, but we just don't have a skill set. We're insular too. We're actually quite introverted and nerdy. Um, and so I, I noticed in, um, as, as those were talking, some of you are at, at locations and universities where there are evidence-based practice centers um, funded by AHRQ and folks like me who think about these methods knock on our door, tell us how to do this, really. Um, so it's, it's just an open invitation to sort of help us figure this out, because there is a need, um, but we are mostly epidemiologists by training. Um, so, so let me just interrupt, because I want bragging rights. Stacy is a, a, also, she mentioned her Brown affiliation, but she's also a, a fellow at Harvard, uh, a fellow of mine at Harvard, and so are two other um, fellows in the back, so I'm glad that you were here. Stacy, where was that paper um, published? Oh, um, so it's Implementation Science, um, mm. and it's uh, the, it's a horrible acronym, so if you can help with acronyms too, that'd be great. So it's um, GRADE, C-E-R, and CIRAQUAL. So, you know, we, I, I think part of the issue, um, if I may, 
when it comes to sort of integration of the qualitative studies is that we have to, at the end, aggregate that data um, with a quality assessment, with the quantitative data. And we struggle with that. So because we have a checklist for the quantitative data, it hits the marks, we can integrate, we can do the meta-analysis, and there, there's our publication. Um, so there's been some work to sort of create a, um, um, a quality of evidence scale for qualitative research. Um, of course, we did it, so I mean, we're not experts in it. We, you know, we, we tried to engage to the degree that we could, um, we as the community. So um, it would be really great. It's an implementation science. I think it's January 25th, and it's a series of, I think, like eight or nine papers where they break down how they developed this um, hmm. um, grading scale of the quality of the evidence. And please use these examples to say, this is where this fails, and this is why it's important. If I, I'd just like to insert one thing about what Joel said, because um, I didn't want it to seem like he, he hadn't been heard. Um, the, the concern about um, ableism and the um, the failure to to speak very ex much very explicitly about some of these assumptions about you know what a normal body is and uh, how a good life goes and all of that. At, at the risk of sounding defensive, I would um, call attention. There were there were some moments in in the event when I thought that I was hearing people talk with a deep awareness of that set of concerns, even though they weren't um, quite explicit. So, for example, Barb yesterday, in her remarks, she didn't. I don't think she ever. Mm -hmm. I, I thought she was very much um, speaking aware mm -hmm. of those very concerns about. Um, expectations bring, people bring to pregnancy and the desire to recognize there are lots of ways to flourish and it's important for genetic counselors and other people to help people make informed decisions about what kind of children they want to bring into the world. So I take your point loud and clear and um, I don't know, I'm kind of gratified that I think we have made progress as a community in, in thinking about these things so much so that we don't sometimes we don't even have to be explicit about them. Uh, maybe that's too rosy of you, but I I'm sorry to interrupt. Mm. Uh, th I think the last two days were great, and um, I'm not really even sure how I ended up here, but uh, one plea I would have is that I think, um, as somebody who's on the front lines and seeing patients, I, I do think that um, what we need is a uh, some place for providers to go to get information that's practical. Um, I, I don't think there is a place, I mean, this idea that we'll just tell, we don't have enough geneticists out there to talk to all patients, we don't have enough genetic counselors, but also saying that the average, you know, OBGYN or family doctor who sees 40 patients a day is going to be able to explain these tests and do pre-test counseling and post-test counseling is just not, you know, it's not, it's, it's not realistic. Um, but having maybe a, a site where you can, you know, s say, do you want to read about this test? Something that's geared towards patients, because I do think what's happened, especially, I mean, uh, my experience as an OB is that the the companies have stepped in and here's your slides, here's your, and but they want you to do the test, <laughs> right? And therefore, I do think this is where government should work. This is why the CDC is where we go when we want to give somebody something about the flu. Um, and, and I do think that we have the internet now. That's, that's a huge plus for this day and age. But also it's, it'll be helpful, I think, to get a provider. So we do, you know, it's, it's not being dictated by some a company versus, you know, a group of very smart people who have, you know, have looked over what is the best way to approach these things rather than telling somebody who's been in practice for 20 years, learn about this and talk to your patients about it because that's not realistic. And I, I think mm -hmm. development of those tools can be informed by our research that would anticipate adverse impacts of receiving that information. So, yeah. Um, it's not a terrible segue to my comment. I'm Carolyn Newhouse from the Hastings Center. And something, Jim, that you said kind of struck a chord in me, which was that um, part of our role as bioethicists, and maybe even a big part of our role, is to point out negatives. Um, and I worry, at, at, and, and you call, I think someone called this Eeyores, which I just find like personally abhorrent. Like no one wants to be an Eeyore. Um, I certainly don't want to be an Eeyore. Um, so I just sort of like okay. trying. Okay. <laughs> so I'm trying to like 
come up with like a rebranding strategy um, <laughs> so that our message is heard by yeah. Yeah. Survivors yeah. and not totally dismissed yeah. by yeah. by people who are really unfair and uncharitable yeah. to naysayers. Yeah, I, and I I, yeah. I I bring that up because it's a it's a source of like personal pain to me because I'm called a naysayer, I'm called negative, so just because I wanted us to adhere to evidence, right? And and I think here's the way around that, and the way around that is to be enthusiastic, right? To recognize the 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 wonderful power of biomedicine to benefit us. Um, and and show that you you really believe that right that's one of the reasons i got a dna tattoo probably right i i i i love genetics right so it really pisses me off when people act like oh you just you know somebody called me a self self-loathing geneticist oh my god oh. Yeah. Oh. yeah yeah you should write so, about that yeah really um, <laughs> you know so but i think the way Show around your that, that that's right that's right <laughs> Really, I think the way around that is to be positive, to, to recognize. That's why I said we should be happy when there are good outcomes, right? We don't want to be the, the, um, yeah. the people who are taking delight in pointing out negatives. We just need to be the grown-ups who do that. So my rebranding strategy was going to be that. Something like understanding the, the conditions under which positive outcomes are sort of are justly distributed occur yeah, yeah. and are justly distributed, which is sort of the positive outcomes that aren't just health, right. but also human flourishing and minimizing general. negatives. You know the, the which requires understanding negatives. Right. I think is like right. Here. And the thing is, you know, everybody somehow the genomics community I feel like has lost sight of the truism that we always do damage in medicine. You know, I've always I remember in medical school feeling like the the Hippocratic oath: first do no harm. We actually do harm, right? But the point is we try we need to try to make sure that the ratio of benefit to harm is really, really favorable. But we're never gonna we're never gonna not do any harm, right? Thanks. I wanted to follow up on that because I think um, right now this negative message um, issue is huge. And I think in all the history of my awareness of the ELSI program, I hear a lot more frustration in the genetics community with ELSI at a time when I think ELSI's doing some of the best research um, that they ever have. And I think um, at the same time with the ELSI conference, there was a merging of geneticists, clinicians, um, even a few heart scientists with the LC community in a way that was very encouraging and I don't think has happened before. So I think that is progressing along, but the genetics community is starting to, it's not about you, Jim. I think your reputation is you're one of the people who actually bridges these communities very effectively. And you can make fun of yourself, but you did a fabulous job at the LC But other conference. people do that for me. No. You did a really Thank good you. job. And that's critical that we have people like you who are, are effective at doing that. But there is a lot of you know, this going on now. There because sure people feel like people get up to the microphone and they say, you know, negative, 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 and it's not heard. Yeah. And probably the geneticists are doing positive, 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 positive um, in an exaggerated way too. So I think there is culpability on both sides, but I would really, so this is what's happened in what some of you might call the ELSI community, I, I'm not sure I would, um, I, I wander in a, in a group that calls themselves the social, um, social and behavioral researchers who are um, psychologists and social scientists who don't want to identify themselves as LC researchers. Mm -hmm. And yet they do, uh, they're, they're the authors of many of those studies that Chris and I and others presented. And there's a reason for that. They don't want to be associated with being a group of naysayers or people who are out to expose problems. So I think this is really a challenge for the, the community. I think we've made great strides, but I think we're at a time, and part of it is, you know, all of us and things that are kind of feeling really pretty big and exaggerated in terms of promise 
causing the LC community maybe to have more things to say, wait a minute, mm -hmm. um, legitimately so. But I, I would just caution all of us to really, really think about the messaging and the approach um, because I think there's a lot of um, yep. shut ears going on. I think that, that this is a really important conversation for, for the field and it's something that I think about every day as the president of the Hastings Center. I do think we have to state our interests in this very positive way that, that you've talked and I mean, of course, of, we all embrace science in this room so I think mm -hmm. it shouldn't be hard to express that and start with that and it, all it needs is a sentence first. I think that would go a long way. But the other thing that's harder to talk about is that we actually have a conflict of interest. Because our main, we have a funding problem. And our funding problem is creating an ethics problem for the field of bioethics. Because we are so dependent on the funding coming from NIH to support this work that we're fundamentally trying to criticize. And it may not even be an accident that most of it has looked at individual harms because NIH is interested in that it want, it has a good it has a good motive it wants the new science and technology to to benefit people and not harm individuals but it doesn't seem to it doesn't care about it's certainly not set up to look at these broader social issues that we were advocating that we look at but we have no financial base for doing that so i mean we have a business model problem mm -hmm. for for mm -hmm. an, for this field and you know I, I, I that's a that's a great point and i it occurs to me sitting here that, that we do have some natural allies in the evidence-based community. You know, I, I'm an internist and internists are pretty steeped in, in evidence-based medicine and, you know, they look at a lot of the genomic activity and just kind of roll their eyes. Um, and I think that we probably can find natural allies in in other communities in those efforts to broaden our our reach um, because we all should be interested in evidence right evidence of good evidence of harm um, and and we shouldn't just look to the genetics community for allies mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm going to push back a little bit on these two comments because I think that first of all I think because uh, I think that if, I think doctors respond and geneticists respond to data, to evidence. So if we were to find evidence of here's harm, I think they would take that seriously. Uh, so I think that, I, I'm not as pessimistic, I shouldn't say pushback, but I'm, a little, I'm, I'm not as pessimistic. And in terms of LC, our conflict of interest, I would say we are the reviewers. I mean, many of us have reviewed LC grants, right? I mean, and so I think my sense is that I'm less clear that if a researcher were to put in a good proposal to study this, the S of ELSI, right, the social implications, the reviewers at least, who are fellow ELSI researchers, I don't think would think, oh no, that, that's a conflict of interest with we're getting the money from, from I, NHGRI. Okay, let, let me just Maybe I'm wrong, but I just well, put that out there. Let me clarify what I mean. I don't mean that ELSI itself has conflicts of interest. I mean the field of bioethics is tremendously skewed to looking at issues at the individual level rather than the population level and looking at individual harms. We always resort to issues of, you know, of uh, informed choice. We are looking at, and we're at that level of, of reality. There's not much, I, I would love to see somebody write a proposal to Elsie to look at the structural and political determinants, to look at lack of integrity in monitoring organizations to study FDA decisions. I just can't imagine that would get funded from that source. And that's our primary source. So that's what I meant by, you know, we, we write grants to get the funds to continue our field and, and, and build careers. So we need a broader uh, source of funding to ensure our independence and our ability to to ask these questions in a variety, you know, beyond what we're asking now. That's so. I'm, I wasn't trying to say anything that Elsie itself was had a conflict of interest. Our field and as is very limited, and we're skewed by where the resources are coming from. Not to say that I'm not all for all the Elsie grants we can get. But ba Barbara, I thought you were making a different point about uh, the way that we communicate with the people doing genetic research. 
Is it, oh. I think that's what you were, and which I've experienced as well. I mean, my work is primarily in epilepsy, and there's tremendous enthusiasm on the part of the epilepsy researchers and clinicians for finding genes, you know, implementing genomic medicine, and nobody's thinking about any anything that is, you know, even an inch on the on the side of a of a risky or adverse impact. And so it's you know, it's hard to be a person who's looking for those things. And and yet when when I write a grant proposal, I have to say Look, you guys, there's a possible negative impact here. And hopefully the LC researchers, you know, can accept that. But I'm also living in the world of all the epilepsy guys. And, you know, that's, it's a hard position to be in. And so it's useful. I find it useful what you said, that the way that we communicate, we really have to think hard about it and not be just a naysayer. Let me just respond quickly to what Millie said. So I, so I would, I, I think we should, I would encourage LC researchers to try to address the social issues, and I think that there may be more willingness to fund such research <laughs> if it's well done methodologically. So, for instance, FDA decisions may be difficult to get access to, but if someone were to do a, a propose a study looking at drug ads, for instance, that are sort of going to be implicitly presumably critical of the drug industry, I think LC researchers would be review that favorably if it was sort of a rigorously done study as an example. Celeste, did you want to say something? Uh, I, I don't know. I have a couple points. One, one is I think actually really um, rigorous uh, social level impact studies are just really, really hard to do. And I, I honestly think that the, this community has not attracted mostly the right people to do those kinds of studies. I mean, you know, there is a, a certain kind of uh, economic social nexus training that I think is required for a lot of the things that we're talking about. And, and I made some efforts to kind of get a, a, you know, people who were uh, interested or skilled in economics to involve, but they, they can make so much money somewhere else. It's really a challenge. I mean, it's one of those things where the, it trickles down. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. And especially I think somebody like the Hastings Center, you know, might say, okay, it's not just we have this nice little call for social level stuff. We have to realize it's hard and it requires some expertise we don't yet have developed mm -hmm. and maybe that's you know part of the puzzle um, so that that's actually my that's easy comment on, on the social <laughs> impact stuff I think the harder thing about this and I like to be instead of Eeyore I would say Yoda <laughs> guiding the proper I'm use of the that. force right um, but I, I've lately I mean in, in when I came into this field I was determined to resist my field which at that time was rhetorical studies just chronic negativity. I mean, that's just like we're critics and no matter what you say, we're against it and we can show you why it's bad, right? And I was like, I'm not gonna do that here. I'm gonna make the good here. Um, and I I've, I've kind of feel like now we're boxed into a place where the social level factors mean mostly, you know, and, and this is that parallel of what's actually come out in the genetics, that mostly we're talking about rare alleles that might have a significant effect, or we're talking about common alleles that don't have a big effect, and yet we're still kind of looking for the, you know, the holy bullet genes. And at this point, it's kind of like, well, the really big problem is that we're spending a lot of money on something that's not optimal. And there's no way I can say that to the geneticists or the enthusiasts. Like you're barking up the wrong tree. It's a really fun and interesting tree, and I'm all for science for the sake of science. But don't promise us all this great stuff because really, you know, it's it's not what we're going to get. And in the meantime, it means we're not spending on other things. So it's really hard yeah. to give. Yeah. I can do I can do interventions that I think help. Like I really like I talked about our gene environment interaction mention. That that does make a small effect that improves how people you know um, take messages of genes to improve their intention behavior. I can do that, and that's part of the guiding process. And and I think the idea that somebody had here, uh, and Barb is says that there's somebody working on this already to have a publicly available set of resources so that when the public gets DTC stuff, there's a good place for them to go to get high quality information. That's a way we can you know, contribute to driving this and so on. But, but the big picture social stuff, ooh, it makes me like, 
throw up my hands. So anyway. Well, the, the big okay. picture okay. social really stuff is hard. There's no doubt about it. And there, I, as I said in the beginning, there's no doubt that geneticists began with a really simple model of the way genes work. And I do stick to my assertion that we in ethics and psychology and sociology have a tendency to do exactly the same thing, to use wildly simplistic models. Perhaps it has something to do with the fact that language is an essentializing machine and we are strategic essentializers. I mean, it might have a lot to do with what you were talking about. Um, so one of the things we plainly have to get over is the idea of silver bullets and simple models. And at the risk of um, you know, sounding defensive, I do think we have to be careful about letting our essentializing tendency get the better of us when we talk about who bioethicists are. <laughs> this group was brought together because of its, in part because of its heterogeneity. Now maybe some of you don't want to be called bioethicists. Sorry, you're here. <laughs> <laughs> so you count. And you know, we really do have people who have a tendency to some emphasize this, you know, let's get on with it. We're enthusiastic. This is great. And we've got some people who are a little more um, critical. Most of us, I think, are constantly moving back and forth between those intuitions. And I don't think we should beat up on ourselves for being simply negative. I don't think we are. And I do think we can own, you know, p important critical observations when we've got them to make. And as I think Millie so nicely said, there are some nice, and you, Jim, and you too, Ruth, said there are some nice, important things to say about. Where we agree. Yeah, yeah. about where we agree, about some forms of commercialization, about renegade testing, et cetera. Mm. Um, one more comment, and then we're going to call it a day. Um, all right, it's more of a question. Um, I was just thinking, uh, what do you think the role of LC researchers is in new emerging epigenetic research in terms of thinking that's kind of bringing together the social and the environmental aspects? And um, yeah, I'm just interested in that. Martine, over to you. <laughs> So Eric calls on me because I'm Martine LePay. I'm a, um, a K awardee at the SEER, and my research focuses on the social and ethical implications of epigenetics. Um, and I'm a medical sociologist, and I do qualitative work. So this has been a really fascinating conversation, and I think that the question that gets raised is really interesting in this context because um, epigenetics in particular does have this opportunity to bring together many of the different threads in terms of both the science and the society side of these discussions um, through the science itself. And uh, the research that I've been doing with actual investigators who are using the tools of epigenetics to look at psychiatric and behavioral outcomes in children um, is promising in terms of scientists actually really being interested in many of the questions that we as ELSI uh, scholars are invested in. And I think they see the nexus of epigenetics as an opportunity to um, correct some of the things that have happened in genomics um, of the past in terms of the essentializing qualities of the science, and also as a significantly challenging domain in which to do that because it is still so focused on the molecular. And so, um, you know, I will just say that I don't think that epigenetics is going to be the um, the solution to any of our ongoing questions. Um, and I think that at the same time, it is an avenue for us to continue to interrogate our own assumptions about what we think the promises of science are um, on its own terms and where we think that our responsibilities lie in terms of asking those hard questions, um, not just of epigenetics, but of all of the areas that we study. And thank you guys for such a wonderful um, discussion. In, in that thank you so much, Martine, for taking that up. Uh, speaking of promises, uh, Paul um, mentioned to me earlier today that an agenda or yesterday, that an agenda is sort of like a promise, you know, you. You should end when you said you're going to end, um, and where where we said we were going to end. Um, so, 
thank you to, to all of you for coming. Um, in some cases, long distances. Thank you to the speakers for really marvelous talks and to the audience for all of these um, terrific questions. I hope everybody gets home safely. Be well. Thank you. Thank you.